All right, good morning. Uh, thank you guys for all joining me. Today we're going to continue working with Illustrator and we're going to explore the idea of logo design through Illustrator. So it'll be about creating your own logo, but at the same time we'll learn a lot about shapes and manipulations with Illustrator. It kind of be an extension of the pen tool, but we'll also use some tools called the Pathfinder tools, which have to do with how you combine and, and work with shapes and to create complex objects. So we'll go through that. Um, in the meantime, I also want to bring up the fact that our next assignment is now uh, posted. So I'm going to share my screen right now, just so that you know that this is coming. And actually, I should get organized here. Hold on. And let's get this here. Okay, perfect. So um, assignment 104 has been posted on, the, on Canvas. Um, which is we're going to be doing a, a kind of a retake on Charlie Harper's uh, animals. If you're not familiar with Charlie Harper, uh, we'll do a whole lecture. It's at the end of next lecture. So we'll talk about color theory next. And at the end of the color theory, we'll talk all about Charlie Harper and you'll get started with Charlie Harper. But essentially, Charlie Harper is a graphic designer that was from the mid 1950s or so. Uh, and he was famous for doing these kind of simplified. Come on. Yeah, these kind of simplified drawings uh, of birds, animals, et cetera, which are very much graphic shapes. So they lend themselves really nicely to uh, Adobe Illustrator. So we'll end up kind of going through those. I'll explain a lot about Charlie Harper in the next lecture, but I like to point out that that's on uh, and it's something that's kind of on the horizon coming up. So um, it's there, it's posted. I'm suspecting you won't get started on it until Wednesday. But at the same time, I wanted to at least bring it up. In terms of today, we're going to be working on logo designs. And so I'll walk you through this part of it. But before we get started on that, it's worth spending some time actually talking about logos and logo designs. So let me pull up my slides here. And so let's talk about logo design. And actually, logo design is one of those fascinating parts of graphic design that's absolutely everywhere. And we're so inundated with it on a regular basis that sometimes we become desensitized to how interesting and unique logos can really be. An effective logo is fundamentally distinctive. It's appropriate for the brand or for, the, for its purpose. It's practical. It's graphic. Generally, the simpler, the better. Simple in form. And it conveys an intended message. So as we start to look at these, we see these all over the place. right? Shell gas. VW, NBC, ABC, Chanel, the Rolling Stones. There's all kinds of these logos that we see on an everyday basis. So when we think about simplicity, we want easy brand recognition of a particular logo. You should be able to see the logo and know what brand it is. It should be versatile. You want to think about it showing up in small places. You know, you could say on a t-shirt, for example, but you also want to see it at large on a billboard. So how we use that logo and where it's going to be used is kind of important. It should also be memorable, unique, memorable, something that will stick out and stand out toward us because it causes us to recognize that as a particular feature. Sometimes it features something unexpected or even unique. So we're all completely familiar with this. But does this have anything to do with coffee? No, it doesn't. But we recognize this logo because we see it so frequently it's Starbucks. And so just with something that simple, we recognize the logo and we have an understanding of what that brand is. Now, some of the logos I'm showing you are just made up logos. And sometimes it's fun to see them in their infancy where this obviously doesn't exist as a brand, but it's kind of fun. And so sometimes these can be just as entertaining as the real logos. You also want to think about your logo as being something that's enduring. What happens in 10, 20, 50 years? Can that logo still exist? Does it follow a fad? Can it be modified? Is it future proof? Is it something that, that you could see on something in uh, you know, two years, five years, et cetera? So let's look in a case study. This was the original Apple computer company logo. Now imagine for a second that this was on the, the backs of our iPhones, on the back of our computers. I don't know that this would have aged quite as well. If we look at the actual evolution of the logo, 
But I can see that original logo. And then we went to the rainbow logo from 1976 to 1998. That was a pretty long tenure. 98 to 2000 was just the Black Apple. That was when it was rebranded, re kind of re -invitalized. Then they used the stylized shiny logo from 2001 to 2007. Then they moved to a, a simpler stylized version from 2007 to about 2017 or so. And then they've gone back kind of to that middle of the road one where it's just a simple, um, simple Apple logo like this. But it's interesting to see that transition over time. So let's talk about the logo design process. So this is a lot like the regular design process. We've got a design brief. We have to understand what it is that we're doing, followed by a research phase, a reference phase, a sketching and conceptualizing phase, finally a reflection phase, and then finally a presentation of that particular logo. So that should look very familiar to the graphic design process. So here's our kind of Venn diagram showing that the bulk of our work is in that sketching and conceptualization phase. Oh no, my pen is dead. I have to draw with fingers. All right, that sketching and conceptualization phase is the big part. Notice that also revisions are important. So we work at the sketching and conceptualizing for quite a while. Then we move into these revisions. We tweak it, we change it, we make it a little bit better. And then we jump into that presentation phase. So let's look at each of these in a little bit more depth, the design brief. So if you were designing for somebody, you would wanna question them and ask them what they're looking for in a logo. What's the intended purpose? Where is it gonna go? Where are you gonna use this logo? This is also a good time to discuss your fee or your cost for coming up with the logo in the first place. Once you have a good understanding of that, you can move into the research phase. So this is what industry does this logo belong in? Is it an architectural logo? Is it an industrial design logo? Is it some other company logo? What other logos are used in the industry? What's standard in the industry? What's the history of previous logos? So in your case, today you're gonna to be doing a logo for yourself. Did you do a logo in 130? Did you like that logo? Was it well representative of you? Those are all important questions. What are your competitors using? You can't go out and copy your competitors, but it's a good idea to understand what they are. Then we move into reference. So research is fundamentally about existing logos that are being used. Reference is more, what are current styles? Are we looking at flat logos? Are we looking at 3D logos? What, what makes a particular logo trendy, et cetera? We're gonna show a bunch of slides toward the end of the lecture about logo trends. So this is where you do some research on logo trends and figure out What's kind of going on in the world of logos? Then we move into sketching and conceptualizing. So like I said, this is the big, the big piece. This is the design piece. So we're gonna develop multiple logo design concepts and explore a variety of ideas. Remember to lean on your intuition. Ah, that's kind of working. Ah, that looks pretty good. No, it doesn't. That's that back of the brain thing talking to you. Fall back on your research and reference steps. So you did that research, you did that reference work. What is that telling us? How does that inform your design? And then you keep producing new ideas, new ideas, new ideas. And then eventually you get to something that, that kind of works. So here's a concept phase where they're working through it. They say, we wanna do something based on a fist. So then we sketch. That gives us our general outline of the fist. And we say, well, let's kind of stylize it a little bit more. And then after we've stylized it a little bit more, let's stylize it a bit more and kind of distill it down into basic shapes. Then let's take it into Illustrator and let's work with Illustrator. So you can see this progression happening rather nicely. And then we end up distilling it down until we start to see our final version of our design. Notice that they have a color, they have a grayscale, and they have a black and white version. And then they say, where would it go? So gonna go on envelopes, business cards, letterhead, all those kinds of pieces. And what would those look like? Here's another example, early sketching. 
And then how do you translate this into an actual logo? So there's some early concepts here. How are we going to draw this in Illustrator, create our gradients? This is back when 3D and these kind of uh, transitions of color were, were big. A little bit of shadowing there. Think about font. We talked a whole lecture about typography and what's happening in the world of font. Here's three different fonts that are very, very similar. Which one's the right one? Which one feels right? Those are all very, very important decisions to make. And then you end up with a final logo. What about though, when that logo turns to grayscale or you can't use print it in color? How do you show that same three dimensionality in black and white or in grayscale? I think they did a really nice job with that down here at the bottom of the page because they added those little white stripes in to give it that three dimensionality, even though it's just a grayscale image. So thinking about grayscale is not a bad idea because sometimes you just can't afford to print in color. Then we move into reflection. This is when you step back from your work and you revisit it with a fresh perspective. Maybe you ask your neighbors, colleagues for their opinion, send it to your friend, ask your mom. Those types of people can give you valuable feedback. Back when I used to do this lecture in person, I actually mandated that you get feedback from the person sitting next to you. And that's something that's important because sometimes you can't see what's happening. I had a student, this was probably five years ago or so. No, it's, how long has COVID been? Three years of being remote? I don't know, it could have been longer than that ago, six years ago, where we were in person. And the student, she was a great student and she worked on a logo for herself. And she sat there all class and worked on this logo, got a really good logo together, was really happy with it. And she turned to her uh, friend and she said, hey, can you take a look at my logo? And they said, oh yeah, that's a nice logo, but you know, it's the Beats logo, right? She's like, wait, what? And then she looked up the Beats logo, like the headphone company. And lo and behold, the logo that she'd spent all class designing was essentially the Beats logo. It had a few variations to it. So those are the kinds of things that sometimes when you're working on it and you're intimately kind of involved in, in working through the details, you lose track of what else is influencing you, what you might be doing subconsciously. And when you ask a friend or you ask a fellow designer to review it, they may see something that you don't. And that's a perfect example. So if you can, ask your friends. Get some feedback from them on what your logo looks like. What, how might they change it? I apologize, some of these are blurry. I don't know what happened to my slides. Maybe I lost the original images on some of these, but I think it's worth kind of looking at it regardless. Now, some of these I'm kind of flipping through rather quickly. Then we get to the presentation phase. This is when you're getting the, you're, you're getting the best ideas together. You're deciding this is the final version. This is what we want to present and you present it to the client. Now, it's entirely possible that you present it to the client. The client says, ooh, I don't really like that. And they want to send you back to do more design work. That's okay. Maybe if you hit it just right, the client will love it. And they'll be all over saying, yes, absolutely, please. Let's use that as our logo. So it depends. And that's that presentation phase when you finally get the feedback of it. Sometimes it's about how does this logo transition or have different times or how can it be used differently? This Mall of America logo they, when they developed it, they developed a whole series of these ribbons and how they would be used. They even had seasonal variations. So you could see how they would work in different seasons. They had patterns that worked as backgrounds. So it's a much more comprehensive design strategy. Learning from others. Think about what brands have succeeded and why. I would say that the Nike swoosh is one of the most iconic logos, company logos of our time. It's so successful because it's so simple. It's so easy to recognize. And that's become a real identity in the shoe world, certainly, or in the clothing, clothing world. So those kinds of things really matter in thinking about that since simplicity. Typography is also important. So you want to think carefully if you're going to include type as to what it looks like, what's the right font. Is the font going to go out of style long term? Are we going to use papyrus? Oh, heaven forbid, right? What about, is it right for your client or your business? We talked about this in the font section. You know, you wouldn't use Comic Sans for something that was kind of business oriented. 
but you would use it for like elementary school. So think about those kinds of things. Maybe you have to design your own font. Maybe you have to design your own lettering for that logo. It's entirely possible. You could load custom fonts. Little details matter. The kerning, the tracking, the, the spacing, the ligatures and how they come together, those all really matter as you start to see it. And you'll see that there are a bunch of logos that are fundamentally text. So they don't really have another logo to it. Coca-Cola is a great one. There's no logo other than the Coca-Cola logo. It's just the text, IBM. Sometimes logos get real creative, right? So we can look at something like the FedEx logo. Now, most people look at this FedEx logo all the time. It's on trucks, it's everywhere, and they don't see the hidden, very creative little bit that's in that FedEx logo. Well, FedEx is fundamentally about moving and shipping packages. So lo and behold, there's a nice little arrow that's hidden inside the FedEx logo because it's about moving packages. That's a creative thing. It's using the negative space. That's a really great way of kind of giving it a little extra to a particular logo. If somebody came to you and said, I need a logo, the company name is Dynamic Dust. How would you create a logo for that? This is something that's super simple, but at the same time, it works really nicely as a logo. You wanna make sure that you're avoiding cliches. Obviously you can't use clip art. This needs to be something custom to your business. Right? You don't want to use a globe for international or world or, or anything like that. A, you know, um, no light bulbs for ideas. Those are all really cliche, overused clip art logos. Don't copy another logo either. That's blatantly obvious. You probably get sued for it too if you became successful. But like, you know, you're, you're not going to go in and say that um, you, know, you have a new company called Kiwi and you draw a little Kiwi and you take a bite out of it and it looks just like the Apple logo, but it's a Kiwi, it's silly. So you need to make sure that you're creating your own logo that is specific and unique to you. When we get to outputting files, remember we're working as a vector. So the cool thing about it is once we create our logo, we can blow it up as large as we want and it won't get distorted. So we're looking at about 1500 pixels by 1500 pixels at 300 DPI. That's kind of our, our sweet spot. Maybe you'd have a JPEG or a PNG version that was 800 by 800 at 72. That would be a web version. You might have a little small one that would be like a little web logo in the upper right corner. Make sure you're saving that AI file. That's the Illustrator file. So that you can go back and re-export, blow it up, make it bigger, et cetera. And then you want to think about what about black and white or a grayscale or a color version? How are those going to work out? What if you were going to print it on a shirt and you were only printing in one color, just white, for example? How would you make that logo work? Those are all important questions to have. So I'm just flipping through some other unique logos. I like that one, the Fox Daddy. So now that we've talked so much about logos, when you go around your day-to-day, -day, think about all the different things that are logos, that are fundamentally logos, and what's happening in those logos. So you look around and you see those, and you start to have a better appreciation for the fact that these are absolutely everywhere. Here's another set of sketches, conceptualizing some 3D modeling and the font it didn't seem quite right here. And then look at a, a transition there, right? So here's one iteration, yeah, not quite right. That's a lot better. What about that? So this is an evolution. What, it would, what would it look like on business cards, for example? So let's look at our logo design trends. This website, Logo Lounge, publishes logo design trends. Some of my slides are a little bit out of date, so I would encourage you to go to Logo Lounge and actually look at the current 2022 trends. Right, but they, they identify what these trends are, and then we get a good understanding of what current logos are looking like. All right, so these are all meant to be 
design ideas and inspiration for you. So this would be in that research phase. phase. All right, and they have um, fun, fun little uh, names for each of these styles. So as you start to look at these, think how they could inform your design decisions. These ones can be tough, the ones where they clip the letters or adjust um, certain, certain fonts uh, because you wanna make sure it's still readable. You understand what those mean. I think the new Kia logo is a perfect example of that where you can sometimes get confused as to what it actually says unless you know it's a Kia. So, like I said, take, take a chance, look at Logo Lounge. So if I were to, oops, sorry. All right, we could go here, we'll go to Logo Lounge. There we go. And so they have this trends button. And here's the 2022 trend report, check it out. All right, and they give a lot of uh, text that it kind of verbally describes this stuff. But then here you go, right? So these are the trends, bow ties. Uh, single drop of water, interesting. Rooters, reverse stress. Loopers, it's kind of interesting with the little loop there. Arches, whiplash, interesting. Dots. <laughs> anyway, you guys can spend some time looking at this. Um, Great articles, and you can see that under their trends here, you can also go back in time. So they started in 2013, and you can see what logos look like in 2013. Oh, looks like they even go back further than that, where they're looking at, at particular logos and logo trends. So anyway, it might be worth looking at. Um, I would look at the more current trends as we start to go forward. So it's there for you to look at. Let's take a little bit of time and actually work through some strategies in Illustrator. So let me open up Illustrator. All right, we'll close the sp splash screen there. We're gonna create a new file altogether. So I'm gonna go into the more presets and instead of picking uh, a standard size here, I'm actually going to type in here, remember we were working at 1500 pixels by, oops, this needs to change to pixels, sorry. There we go, 1500 pixels by 1500. Why is that not changing? It's totally bizarre that it won't change for me. Hmm. Why? Why are we being strange? Huh. Is it because you have A4 selected? I have what for? A4 I on the left. Be. Yeah, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't make any difference. I should be able to change this. But it's like it's my control key is stuck or something. There. Yeah, it was, it was my control key on the keyboard was stuck. Sorry about that. <laughs> Going, wait, why is that not working? I should have been looking at my... Um, little key logs here showing that. Okay, 
1500 pixels by 1500 pixels. That's what we're looking for. Now, remember, we talked about, or actually, we haven't talked about color mode yet. That's next class. Uh, CMYK is for printing, so we'll stick in CMYK color mode. Our um, resolution should be 300. So we'll go ahead and click on create. And there we are. So this is by no means a fixed thing. We can obviously, we can change our size. We can change uh, and do multiple versions. We can have different layers where we're working on different versions. But what I want to introduce to you is the concept of how you go about kind of starting with your particular uh, logo design. And so I'm going to work with layers because I'll end up working with lots of different things as we create examples here. But I'll start with layer one. And as we go forward, I'll add more layers so that I can turn things off. But let's say that I wanted to start with some basic shape. So let's say I wanted a square. So I can hold down shift to make sure that it stays proportional. And let's say that I create a, a, a square. Now you can see that I'm having trouble getting it exactly 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels. If I want, I can just single click, and it'll present me with a dialog box where I can actually type in a particular value. So uh, that was not what I wanted. Let's do 900 by 900. And I'll say, OK. And that just gives me a specific size. Now, right now, if I look over here at my fill color, it's being filled with white, and it has an outline or a stroke color of black. I'm going to take my fill color here. I'm going to double click on it, and we're going to make it a color for right now. And I'm going to take my stroke color, my outline, and I'm going to actually make it go away. So I'm going to click on None. And that gives me just a plain box like this. Now let's say that I wanted to kind of make this into a shield, for example. Well, I could start by manipulating my pieces, just like we did with the pen tool before. I could come in here with my uh, direct select. I could pick one of the corners here, and I can move one of the corners in a little bit. I can move this corner in just a little bit more, too, to start to create a different shape, for example. I could also use the pen tool here to add an anchor point right in the middle of this line right there. And then I could use my direct select, my white arrow, to pull this line down to start to create that shape. Now I can also, if I, had, uh, if I had a shape, let me create a new layer here. Let's say that I had that same square, 900 by 900, and then I drew a triangle that was down here. Like that. And I closed it. Now, these are two separate shapes right now. I could move them together, and they would start to look like they belong together, like that. However, since they're still two separate shapes, I haven't like joined them together. We can use some tools called the Pathfinder tools. So if I go to a uh, window, and I choose Pathfinder, it'll bring up this little Pathfinder tool set. And so you can see here that I have under shape modes, I can actually take two pieces. I could take this hold down shift and take that, and then use this shape mode to unite them. And now they become one shape, which is a little bit different than we had before. I could still use my direct select to pick one of the endpoints and move that around. So if I didn't like a particular endpoint or if I wanted it to go back inside on itself, I could do that, for example. So it's just a way of starting to combine pieces together. Well, I can also use that to my advantage if I wanted to cut something out. So let's say that I wanted to cut out a square that was inside. Right, so let's say I wanted to take that square, and I wanted to subtract this from the square behind. I could hold down Shift and select them both. And then right here, you could see that it's minus front. And that means that I, I'm going to subtract the object that's in front, and I'm cutting it out. Just so that you can see this, I'll create another object. Let me change the color on this object. And then let me send it to the back. So you can see that that is not a white square, but it's actually transparent underneath it. So 
that's certainly something that we can do. Let me go ahead and create a new layer. All right, so let's come back to that square. So I've been working consistently with the 900 by 900. Say OK. Now, let me go back. I'm going to go back to that first example where I pulled these sides in a little bit. I'm going to use the arrow keys on the keyboard to make this even. So I'll count while I do it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I just moved it in by 20 nudges there. Do the same thing here. Perfect. So I just did that. I'm going to click the pen tool. I'm going to add an anchor point right there. We'll select the anchor point and I'll pull it down to kind of create that shield. All right, something along those lines. Now, what if I wanted to kind of modify this? Well, I could take my shape here. I could copy it. So let's go to edit, copy. Let's go to edit, paste in place. So it's right on top of itself. And then maybe I want to scale that whole thing down. So we could take the whole object, we could scale it down a bit. And then we could use our align tools just to make this a little clearer, I'll change the color of it. Okay, I can use my align tools. I could select both of these objects. I can pick the blue object as my key object. And then I can come over here to align. We'll align to the center and we'll align to the center vertically. And now that you now you can kind of see that I've created a second object inside. Now I could also cut these out where I took these two and I did a minus front. Go back to Pathfinder, I can do a minus front, etc. Now, before I get into the minus front though, maybe I want to add another, uh, let's say, let's put a letter in. So I could put a G for example, All right? So I could take that, let's go over into our properties. Let's change our font size here. It's probably gonna be, that's nowhere near big enough. Let's go 500. That's still nowhere near big enough. Let's go 1,000. All right, so I could do something like that. And again, I can use my um, align tools, picking that as the key object, and I can work to align it. Then I could take this text and I could go up to type and create outlines. We did this before in InDesign where we converted the font into an actual shape. So now I could actually subtract this font from the font that was behind if I wanted to. So I could take this and that and I could use my Pathfinder and I could subtract the front there. And so this now is independent of the shield that's behind it which may or may not be what we're after doing. All right, well, let's explore some of the other Pathfinder tools. So let me go on to layers here, create a new layer. Let's explore some of the other Pathfinder tools. I'm gonna go ahead and come back to that 900 pixel square. And then I'm gonna create another shape on top. So let's do an ellipse tool on top. We'll do that and I'm gonna change the color just so that we can see it a little bit easier. There we go. So let's explore what the rest of the shape modes do. So we've already explored the first one, which was Unite. That makes those two one shape. So you can see it there making it one shape. I'm gonna back up. The second option was the minus front. We looked at that one before too, where it cuts out the object that's in front. Now, what about the third option here? This one is the intersection. So what it's going to leave is where the two overlap, just that piece. And then the last option here is the um, exclude. So the places where it's overlapping gets excluded from the shape. So any of those options may be beneficial to you. 
Let's take it a step further and let's look down here. Those are the shape modes. Let's look at the pathfinders. So the pathfinders, the first option here is divide. And what that does is it gives us four or three separate shapes. So I'm going to have to use the direct select to, to select them individually, but you can see that it creates three separate shapes for us. So let me undo those, put those back together. There we are. And let's look at this example. This is a trim. So it'll trim out the back object, but it leaves the front object. So again, I have to use my direct select, my white arrow, to select just the circle here. And you can see that it's trimmed that out. Let me undo here. There we are. Next option here is the merge. So it merges the two objects together, but it doesn't unite them into one object. So it's kind of like grouping. Okay. Then we have a few more. This is our crop where we end up with just that remaining piece, similar to the shape tools. This one is going to give us just outlines of all the shapes, or just lines of all the shapes. And then this last one is to subtract the back off the front. So again, just different options that are available to you. So I like to let you explore all of those options. So as we start to pursue a final logo, right? Maybe I like it where this is removed. And then I want to add, uh, you know, my name here. So let's take that and let's drop this down to, it's probably about 200. Let's go down 100. right in here. Let's see if I think that it's going to need to be a little bit bigger. Um, if you have few few objects, one on top of the other, how can you choose the one that you want? There is a way uh, you can uh, select a specific one. Uh, so if you have multiple objects on top of each other, so let's say that I have, I'm, I'm creating some other objects. If, if I can, obviously I'll pick the object from where it's not overlapping. But if I was trying to select this object, from underneath here, for example, where they're overlapping, but I want the one below it. Uh, sometimes you can go to select last object below, and it should select that one. But of course, it didn't here. Last object below. Come on. No, it doesn't want to do it for me, but that should be how you do it. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry that it's not working. Select. How about next object below? Okay, there we go. Select the next object below. Select. Next object below. Hmm, okay. I'm surprised because here, I wonder if right here, select. Next object below. Select. Next object below. There we go. So let me walk through that again. If I were to select this object, right? It's selected. I want the object behind it. In order to select it, I would right click where the two overlap and say select next object below, and it'll move to this object. Once this object selected, if I want the back object, again, I can right click. I can go to select next object below, and I'll get that object. Great. Where I, where I was screwing up was was I wasn't I wasn't right clicking over the point where they overlap. So that's what we need to do. All right. So let me get rid of this shape. Let me get rid of this shape, and then I could take this, and I could do my. Uh, oh, excuse me. I have to do a create outlines of this shape. So let's take this. Let's go to object, create outlines. Excuse me. It's under type, create outlines. There we go. And then I can take these two 
and I could subtract what's in front. And now that's been cut out. So I'm starting to, to generate the logo. I have no idea where I'm going with this, but I'm just showing you that these are different options. Now, maybe we wanted to change the color tone of this object a little bit, okay? So this is an example of where sometimes we can use the Pathfinder to our advantage. Let me go ahead, I'm gonna use the rectangle tool here and I'll do another rectangle at 900 by 900. And then I'm going to rotate this. So I'm gonna to move to the corner until I get that symbol right there, the double-sided arrow. And I'm gonna rotate this to 45. So if I hold down shift, it'll rotate to 45. And then I'm gonna move it so that it's halfway on my object. Oops, it's not quite big enough. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Like that. So I have these two objects overlapping. They're right at that 50%. And so what I can do is I could take these two objects and select them. So let's take those two objects. And then I could use this divide, which is gonna divide all the pieces together. I can then go in with my white arrow, select this part, which I don't want, but it's going to separate these two parts. And that would then allow me to change this part to, for example, a lighter color. So I can double click on the color and we could drop the color value down. Um, let's just drop it like this. It needs to go a little bit more so you can see it. And then I could have a two-tone. So I'm using that to split my um, design a bit. So just different strategies for how you go about creating things. Let's create another layer here. And this is really what today is all about. It's, it's working yourself through a whole variety of different objects. And so we could come in here and- Can, uh, I, mix, can, I, mix the, can I mix the color when, they, when you cut it? Can there is a way to mix it? So it, would be not, it won't be straight? You wanted to blur the color? Yeah, to blur, thanks. Sure, sure. So you do have the ability, and we're, we're not getting into this quite yet. We'll get into it a little bit later, but I'll go ahead and show it to you anyway. Um, so with any one of these objects, when it's selected, uh, there is an effect menu. And from the effect menu, you can start to do things like blur an object or distort an object. Um, you can stylize. So there's, this is, I don't want to get into it in too much detail, but there are lots of different options. So blur, for example, we could do a, a you know, a radial blur of that object. And it may not actually look good because yeah, well, we don't have enough color variation in it um, to blur it. Oh, there you go. It did it. Um, so that was a, a rotational blur. It may not be exactly what you were after, but we can we can do that. Um, you may want more of a feather. Does she mean gradient, maybe? Yeah, you could certainly do a gradient. Uh, I was trying to feather just the edge. If we wanted a gradient, let's do a gradient. Um, that's a good suggestion. So there is a gradient tool here, right? And in the gradient tool, we can actually start to generate a gradient. Um, it will, let's go into our window and we have the gradient window right here. And so this is where we can choose the type of gradient. Sometimes you create the gradient first. Oops, come on. There it is. Let me change the orientation right here under there. Let's go to 45. There we go. So it's going in that direction. And then if you want color, we should be able to double click on the end here and get a particular color. So I could start with say that color in that corner and then I'm feathering it to white on this corner just a different strategy. If you wanted it to be a tighter transition, you could do something where you drag that middle over and then the gradient's gonna be a tighter little transition. So just different strategies again. So today is fundamentally about exploring the Pathfinder tool. I'm glad you suggested the gradient, whoever suggested it, that's good uh, to show you. Um, you do wanna work with the gradient Beyond just the gradient tool, I think the gradient little window here makes a big difference and it's worth kind of looking at. Uh, if you wanted it to become transparent rather than white, you could come in here and you can adjust the opacity of this slider 
So we could drop the opacity down to zero and then it becomes transparent. So if we had an object that was behind, uh, hold on, I need to make sure that this is a solid object. We go to arrange, send to back. And why is it not? Hang on. I didn't actually adjust my object. Sorry about that. There we go, where it's becoming transparent. So you, you can see how you can layer those up if you wanted. Uh, in this scenario, I'm not sure that you want to do that, but I'm trying to at least let you know that that exists as an option. Okay, so we've done the Pathfinder tools. We've walked through those. We've done our gradient tools. Um, the only last thing is that some people like to do um, you know, the, the bars or, or the, the pieces where they're kind of a, a repeating pattern, for example. So let's do one with that. Let me go ahead and create a brand new layer. Move up to a new layer, turn those guys off. Uh, and so we have two choices. So if we want to, we could of course create a series of bars with the pen tool. Sorry, there we go. We could create a series of bars with the pen tool or lines. We can use the line segment tool here to create a series of bars. The problem with that is that we're stuck when we start to blow it up with a particular thickness. And as we get the, the image to be larger and larger, it's going to not register the changes in thickness without us going in and changing it manually. So what I would encourage you to do if you were interested in doing something with a, a repeating pattern of bars, for example, is to actually use the rectangle tool and to specify the bar. So I'd say my width is maybe 10 pixels and my height is 900, for example, and that would create a bar. And we don't need this to be, let's pick a different color, there we go. And all right, there it is. Then I could take this and we could copy it. So control C, control V, and we can create multiples of these. So I have 20. I could arrange them roughly, or I could select them all. We could go into our line, align tools. I could align to the top, and then I could use my distribute spacing down here to distribute the objects. Uh, why is it not letting me type in a value? I'm not sure. Uh, and that's gonna create a bunch of these objects. Let's create a bunch more. There they are. And there they are. So I've created that, that repeating pattern like that. Then just like we did before, I could use another shape to cut part of these out. So I could come in here with the ellipse tool, for example, like that. And just like I did before, I could select all of the, well, I have to do one other step. Let's take all of these objects in the back. Let's go to Pathfinder. Let's unite them into one object. There we go. Then I could select these two and subtract the front. Oops. That's what I was afraid of. Okay, so the unite didn't quite work. Uh, let me go to object, compound path, make, and then let's see if it'll do it. There we go. Okay, so what I need to do, and I'll walk you through that. I thought I could do it with the shape modes, but it doesn't look like it works. Because these are all individual little pieces, I need to select all of them and I need to make them one. And I'll do that by going to object and then compound path and then make. That makes those into one object. Then I could take these and subtract the front off of my series of lines. I could also, if I didn't like that one, and this is where iterations are really important, right? So I could drop this down and that's, let me create a new one here. All right, let's control where this is gonna cut through here, right about like that. I could take these two and I could subtract those like that. 
So just different strategies. And this may be something that you want to do. Uh, that's how you would go about doing the individual lines. I find it easiest to make the repeating pattern of lines and then cut it, right? If we wanted to cut off one of the corners, we could do the same thing where we use our rectangle tool or better yet, we could just use our pen tool, draw the object like this that we wanted to use to cut. There it is. And then same thing, we could select these two and we could subtract the object that's in front, oops. Take all of these together. Make sure that they're compound path first. And then we can take those and subtract the front like that. So the key when you have multiple objects is making sure that we're using our compound path. So again, that's under object, compound path, make. Okay, so I know it's a lot to take in. I'm going to give you a little bit of extra time. We're done a little bit early today because I want you to actually have a little bit more time as you play around with this. Notice that it's really easy to create lots and lots of versions, and that's normal. And that might be something that you do over time where you create lots of different versions. I've done it. I wonder, no, I can't do it because it's on the remote desktop. I was going to show you an example where I was working on a logo. Um, and there's a whole bunch of iterative process where you keep trying different things and, and working through different things. Okay. so. I'll go ahead and I'll let you guys go. Uh, we'll come back at, uh, let's say, 9.10 for my first check-in group. Remember that we do have check-ins this week. So I'm looking forward to seeing each of you and talking to you this week, making sure everything's going all right. Uh, I know that there was a few people that sent me messages in Canvas over the weekend that they were having some trouble in Illustrator, getting the fonts to work, getting the pen tool to work. That's exactly what check-ins are for. So we'll go through that today. We'll make sure that you get unstuck uh, and feel comfortable moving forward. Next class, we're going to talk about color theory. I do mention a little bit about color theory in our exercise 114. Uh, you don't really have to worry about the color theory, color theory part. This is the optional part right there. We'll cover that in depth next class. Okay. We'll also start working on our Charlie Harper's next class. So you'll feel a little bit more comfortable. We actually will have the bulk of the time uh, during lab to work on getting started with your Charlie Harper's. Okay. So um, if anybody has any global questions, I'm happy to answer those. If not, you're free to go. I'll see you back at 910.